Yeah, so I think one thing um, is that it gives greater impetus to um, trying to refine what, what we know about the future viability of the green and ice sheet. Uh, it, we are currently really quite uncertain quantitatively what will happen to it. Uh, it is believed that, well, on many evidence, it is believed that it would not survive uh, in above some threshold of warming. That is, if we, if the global climate change, if global temperature change exceeds some threshold and then we maintain that climate forever, uh, the Greenland ice sheet would disappear over a, a period of centuries and millennia, which would raise global mean sea level by um, seven metres. So that would be a huge impact, of course, though not one that develops overnight, but over many centuries. The problem is we don't know where the threshold is exactly, so we, we don't know how near we are. And a, a range of studies have looked into this. Um, and uh, some of them have suggested that the threshold uh, for loss of the green and ice sheet could be a, as low as one degree above pre-industrial, um, which means that you know we're in that range if we're considering uh, we, we, I mean, we may already have passed that in fact. On the other hand, other, other studies suggest it might be two or it might be even as far as, far as four degrees above pre-industrial. Uh, so it could make a real difference to the green and ice sheet, whether the temperature was held below 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial or, or two. Um, and, and therefore, we would really like to refine this threshold more. To think about it, it, I think it will change what we do a lot, because what we've tended to focus on is, it, of course, the debate in a way has been, is climate change happening? Is it anthropogenic? And so a lot of the statements from the IPCC have been basically focusing on, yes, uh, Arctic sea ice is d d disappearing because of climate change, et cetera without being very quantitative. And so now, all of a sudden, we're forced to be much more quantitative, because you have to say, what do these targets really have to be? And we've been able not to be, we, we've got away with not being terribly quantitative, with just being, you know, giving a yes-no answer, that yes, this is what's going to happen. But now we're going to have to say how much. And I think that really is going to put a, really force a paradigm shift in how we think about our, our research. I think. Um, a lot of scientists think of the quantification as being kind of a boring part, and the and the the, the exciting part, the intellectually challenging part, is understanding. But actually, getting it right, the numbers right, is an important, very important challenge. And we don't really know how to do that. That's, that's going to be a really new science in itself. I think there's a certain amount of um, variation between different scientists. So um, when the when the UNFCCC first um, suggested the special report there were some debates going on like should the IPCC accept or not and it would be quite difficult I think for the IPCC not to accept that but some people were saying well we won't have enough evidence um, and that's what a special report should be it shouldn't be um, just a, uh, a purely like expert dissertation it should be like a summary of research um, and so I think there are a lot of scientists who are really keen to do extra research and it is a new challenge in a way because we have to fast track some of the timescales that we usually work to. Um, and um, for, for example, the uh, methods paper that I've written, like the review of methods, um, I submitted that in September and it's still in review. and. You know, some of the journals are faster than others, but that's just one example where our kind of usual academic timescales are just not really designed to deal with producing a special report in a couple of years. Well, obviously, academic research doesn't normally operate on a timetable, um, but being given a new challenge like this, I think actually has really excited the academic community. Uh, we're, very key, we're very happy to be researching the difference between 2 degrees and 1.5 degrees. Uh, most of us were expecting we'd be spending our time at the moment researching the difference between 2 degrees and 4 or 5 degrees. So this is a new challenge. Uh, it's, a, it's actually quite a difficult one. I mean, we're talking about relatively subtle levels of warming where we have to really think much harder about natural variability and so forth um, to take that into account when we're talking about the risks of these different levels of warming. So it brings new challenges for the research, but it's, challenge, it's challenges we're happy to take on. The IPCC special report and probably the sixth assessment report, 
they provide a really good opportunity to refresh the assumptions that are in a lot of the um, analysis on the costs and cost reduction possibilities of some key low carbon technologies. Um, so it's difficult for modelers to actually keep pace with what's been going on in the solar photovoltaic and battery markets. Um, we're constantly surprised at how much continued innovation and cost reduction happens with those technologies. Um, so I think doing the 1.5C work and subsequent work is a really good opportunity to refresh our assumptions in our models. And I am confident that that's going to give us a more optimistic picture about the costs um, to the economy of decarbonising. I think it could actually come out as looking a lot less costly than we've seen in the past because we're now reaching um, fossil fuel parity with a number of these low carbon technologies. So that I think is a kind of good news story on the one hand and on the other hand a really important thing to build into the models. Um, so that would be an additional point that's important I think to, to add. I think there are probably mixed feelings. On the one hand, as I sort of said, that, that renewed ambition, that renewed drive for, um, for a need to sort of uh, to reconsider whether or not two degrees is doing enough to protect the public's health is a good thing. On the other hand, there is a need to look at what the implications of that are. Um, and I suppose, I suppose from a health perspective, those just aren't known yet. We just don't know what the potential health uh, side effects are of an, an increase in the sort of in the level of mitigation and the level of you know adaptation that might need to couple with that um, that 1.5 necessitates. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we would you know caution slowing down, um, but it means that there's a need to sort of scale up some of that research to look at what those health implications are. Now it may well be that the health implications are for the most part positive. What work we've done so far in in the health co-benefits of climate change mitigation suggests that, as I said earlier, a vast majority of what you can do is broadly a very positive thing for public health and produces cost savings beyond the initial investment of that climate mitigation policy. Um, those studies haven't necessarily gone and looked at the difference of that extra 0.5 degrees of mitigation. And that's just something that needs to, needs to happen. It's entirely possible, it's probable, that the, you're going to see just as many of those positive benefits come through. Um, but uh, I think as, as health professionals and as sort of any doctor or nurse would say, they want to see the evidence first before they, they try the treatment out on the patient.